Okay, hi there. Ap apologies for the uh, awkward beginning. Uh, that's that's how life works on on Zoom these days. We're full of awkward beginnings and often uh, awkward middles and ends as well. But but we're all doing our best, and uh, and hopefully we're going to be doing these things face to face before too long. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Eric Kleinerberg. I'm the director of the Institute for Public Knowledge and a professor of uh, sociology here at New York University. Uh, I say here with all the usual caveats because there's no more here anymore, or at least uh, at this moment in history. Um, we're, we're hoping that ends soon. The good news is that um, we're, we're together in, in whatever format we can be together. Um, and we've had occasion to spend a lot of evenings together recently with IPK, uh, trying to make sense of this moment we're living through, uh, the antecedents of this moment, uh, the problems that uh, we, we can't quite solve, and uh, the future that's in front of us that we're making in real time. And we appreciate you uh, being frequent uh, visitors, attendees, participants in our conversations. Um, tonight's conversation could not be any more on point. Um, we are here to launch and celebrate and uh, discuss, debate, maybe even criticize a little bit because that's what we academics do for fun. Uh, Guo Bin Yang's uh, brand new book, not even out yet, which is why I have the galleys, uh, The Wuhan Lockdown. Um, uh, it's it's really a pleasure to uh, to do this event. Um, many of us can't stop thinking about the pandemic, uh, and there have not been a lot of uh, kind of well thought out guides for making sense of what we've lived through. And in fact, you know, one of the signal features of this event is that so much has happened so fast that it has been hard for us to uh, digest, let alone make sense of. Uh, everything we've done. And, you know, one of the first order challenges of this moment is to just stop and pause and dwell on moments that were especially consequential. Uh, and it's, it's all, there are all kinds of challenges for that. Um, uh, one of which is that this is a global event. And um, there's some places where the action mattered more than in others. And what's exciting about um, Guo Bin Yang's book uh, is that he has captured this especially consequential moment of time. And what happened in Wuhan, uh, a city of 11 million people during the very early stages uh, of the coronavirus outbreak that would turn into the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is uh, an outbreak that began depending on whose science you believe in November and who by province or in December, uh, more likely, uh, the disease outbreak really accelerated into January, began to um, circulate around the world in January, and um, you know very quickly became what it is right now. Uh, many of us have very few resources for making sense of the initial situation uh, in China. We lack the special knowledge of the nation or the area. We lack the language skills. The background of history and sociology, you would need to make sense of this situation. And Guobin, who has a PhD in sociology from my department at New York University, uh, and is a professor of communications at University of Pennsylvania, Annenberg, uh, happens to have a, a long research record of a few decades of studying uh, civic life and political action, uh, political debate, organizing, dissent, state power uh, in China. And uh, I had the honor of having him earlier today in my seminar on the pandemic in which he uh, told us about watching this situation unfold in real time and figuring out that there was an extraordinary way to capture it, uh, which involved looking very closely at what people were posting in their virtual diaries, their online diaries, you know, blogs or social media posts over time. And for a social scientist, this is really a, a kind of brilliant idea. Uh, a lot of us for our research do things like interviews, which are formalized and which ask people to remember things about their lives. And those conversations are always a little bit artificial as are those kinds of data because they ask people um, to remember things that they you know, may or may not remember uh, uh, well. And it, what, what, what Professor Yang did instead uh, is capture those diary entries uh, and turn them into uh, a kind of corpus or an archive that he could use uh, to help us understand 
this kind of extraordinary, unprecedented situation, locking down uh, with very little notice, a city of 11 million people, um, and then watching to see what happens. Uh, we're really in for a treat tonight. Uh, we're gonna uh, hear from uh, Professor Yang for about uh, 20, 25 minutes. Then uh, we have two terrific uh, panelists. First, Lily Chumley, who's my colleague at NYU. She's an associate professor of media, culture, and communication. And she's also the author of Practicing Creativity, Art School and Culture Work in Post-Socialist China, uh, which is published by Princeton. And she's also a participant in a lot of Institute for Public Knowledge uh, projects. Lily, it's nice to see you and have you back here, even if it's virtual. Uh, and then we'll hear from Ian Johnson, who is the Stephen A. Schwartzman Senior Fellow for China Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations and an expert in Chinese politics, society, and religion. Uh, he's written uh, several books, uh, The Souls of China, The Return of Religion After Mao, uh, Wild Grass, Three Stories of Change in Modern China. Uh, and he's also written a book called The Mosque in Munich, Nazis, the CIA, and the Rise of the Muslim Brotherhood in the West. Uh, though presumably we're going to be drawing on that a little bit less tonight and but we'll, I will have you for a future conversation because unfortunately that that's another topic that we need to make sense of but uh the the, the format is uh they'll speak uh then you'll have a chance to uh, ask some questions as well uh due to the uh, technology the way we're doing this is just we're, we're asking you to enter your questions into the q a function which is now at the bottom of the zoom screen i know you're now experts at zoom and don't need me for that but i'm just reminding you you can scroll down and find the q a there feel free to write out your question uh, at any point during the conversation um, and the last thing i will say is this is a book launch and if it were ordinary times at ipk uh, after the conversation we have here uh, we would all go out to the common room and celebrate with a toast and uh, we'd make sure that the bookseller who comes uh, didn't have to leave carrying boxes of books home we, we'd all buy the book and so um, uh, we don't we can't do that we can't share the wine but our event is still free and we would really appreciate it if you would support uh, Pro professor yang and his research in columbia university press which has put this book out uh, we've put a link into the chat where you can get your own copy of the wuhan lockdown which is now shipping um, and, I, and I hope you'll do that. So sorry for the long introduction, but I'm really excited about this evening's program. And with that, I'm going to pass it to you, Guoban. Thank you so much, Eric, um, for such a warm and kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation um, to, to do today's event. Um, and, and of course, I'm very grateful to Lily and Ian for for their time on reading the book and um, offering comments. Um, for those of you who observe the Lunar New Year Festival, um, today is the New Year's Eve, so Happy New Year. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, Wuhan lockdown happened uh, two years ago, right before the uh, Lunar New Year um, happened, um, started on January 23rd, 2000. And three, and uh, very soon uh, we realized it was just such an extraordinary event. And uh, I wanted to do um, some writing about it. I wanted to collect uh, um, documents uh, that were already being produced in large volumes um, at the time. So uh, we all know that Wuhan was the first city in the world to be locked down due to the COVID pandemic. Um, many other cities in China and the world were also locked down later, but uh, no other city was sealed off as abruptly and as tightly and for as long as Wuhan. And Wuhan was a metropolitan city of 11 million people. So we can imagine how extraordinary this lockdown uh, was, was, you know, um, Two years uh, afterwards, uh, it's just uh, even, even more difficult to understand uh, the scale of the event. So um, I wanted to write about it, but it was challenging to write about the unfolding crisis. Uh, when I started, I started uh, you know, very early on, and there was still a lot of uncertainty. Uh, nobody knew at the time when the lockdown would be lifted, for one thing. But to make things worse, um, very soon we remember, you know, the crisis hit close home 
uh, here in Philadelphia, in New York, US, and uh, it became uh, very personal. Um, the story of Wuhan also then became very much entangled with uh, US-China relations, with global geopolitics, anti-Asian racism, and hate crimes in my own neighborhood. So with this kind of event, I didn't want to write a kind of conventional academic study um, because it's just uh, so personal, but also profoundly um, global in a way. Um, I think the story of Wuhan uh, will be told in many different ways and should be told from multiple angles. But what was most striking to me about it was um, was that it was a, was a story of humanity, ordinary but honorable humanity in times of a unusual crisis. So what I wanted to do really was to just try to tell these stories. Um, and of course, I had some inspiration from, from scholars uh, in the field you know, back in 2007, sociologist Andrew Abbott had called for a new form of sociological writing, which he called lyrical sociology. The lyrical sociologist is moved by an event and then tries to write in a way that can convey their feelings to readers. Later on, uh, scholars like my colleagues at Penn, Professor Heather Love, Professor John Jackson, um, you know, scholars uh, like Sharon Marcus at Columbia, Stephen Best at Berkeley, Rita Felsky at UVA, many others. They wrote in very compelling ways about the importance of documentation and description in scholarly writing, as opposed to the long-standing tradition of theoretical critique. Um, sociologists like Seamus Khan and you know, NYU's own Max Vesprey have also called for uh, in, in, in an article in sociological theory, less theory, more description in sociology. So I think these ideas really suit our times. And I wanted to see whether I could put them into practice. So in this sense, the book um, is quite experimental in, st in style. Um, but luckily, um, I had no shortage of good, da good data for telling the stories about Wuhan, as uh, Eric uh, just mentioned, there was a huge amount of um, personal documents um, like diaries, uh, social media postings, uh, and many others, you know, poems, photography, videos. Um, these were produced in large numbers on Chinese social media. Um, I can't think of any other major historical event in recent history, which has produced uh, as many documents of this kind um, as the Wuhan lockdown. I think, uh, you know, it, it's really a, quite a miracle that, um, you know, so many people in Wuhan and other parts of China recorded their daily lives and shared these on social media, uh, despite all the hardships they had to go through. Um, now dealing with pandemic, but dealing, you know, writing and posting diaries uh, was itself quite a hardship. You know, it took time and effort, um, not an easy thing to do, but they were extremely valuable as uh, materials for sociological writing. Um, you know, uh, sociologists in the past have used letters and memoirs, um, um, but letters and memoirs, they, they were valuable, kind of uh, similar uh, personal documents, personal records, um, different from interviews. But online postings and online diaries were different uh, from those earlier genres in, in one critical sense. Um, these diaries, which are shared on social media, they generated a lot of um, user comments and interactions communities, online communities formed around them. So these user comments and interactions 
a really important part of the diaries and the discourse, um, which you know earlier genres of personal documents didn't have. I mean, some of these diaries were later published in print form, but they didn't have the interaction and user comments. And I thought those uh, published books are actually incomplete. Um, so a little about the book. Um, it follows a roughly chronological order, starting with the beginning of the lockdown and ending roughly with the end of the lockdown on April the 8th, extending a little after that, uh, actually. Um, but the chapters are structured by theme, uh, not uh, by chronology, only roughly you know, chronology. So for example, chapter three is called People's Wall. And it's about citizen responses to state mobilization. Chapter six is called civic organizing and tells stories of citizens self-mobilization and voluntary organizing. Each chapter, um, I have nine chapters altogether. Uh, each chapter presents a series of dramatic scenes and characters and in order to make the stories and you know, characters uh, understandable, I try to provide a good amount of context, cultural, historical context. So uh, you know, in terms of the narrative structure of the book is uh, roughly built on these three elements, scenes, characters, and context. Um, the scenes and characters uh, show different aspects of life during the lockdown, most of them are about how the government mobilized citizens and how citizens responded, um, or how citizens um, you know, um, endured hardships in their efforts to fight COVID. Uh, many of these stories and the story, you know, many of these scenes and the stories of the people are familiar to the Chinese public who were following the event at the time. Um, and, you know, some of the you know, readers here may also be following, and you, a lot of people know the story of Dr. Li Wenliang, who died of COVID. Uh, stories of Fang Fang's diary, Dr. Ai Fen's story, uh, many viral videos about the um, temporary shelter hospitals, and so on and so forth. Um, these are some of the better known scenes and characters I cover in the book. I also wrote about uh, lesser known figures and scenes, um, some, such as delivery drivers, COVID patients, uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, stories of the diarists themselves. I think I cited, I read a lot of diaries, but I cited uh, uh, by my count more than 46 diarists in the entire book. So sociologists view scenes uh, as processes rather, as, rather than stable institutions. Scenes are happenings in time and place. They're conditioned but not determined by social and institutional factors. Um, urban sociologists, for example, study urban scenes in which cultural practices are articulated. Scholars of popular music consider music scenes as effervescent moments of cultural production. Um, so for me, a focus on scene uh, helps to capture the fluid and dynamic features of the lo lockdown experiences, um, effervescent moments of social production even. Um, so that's one kind of uh, one aspect of the book I have um, stories, descriptions of variety of, of scenes uh, throughout the lockdown period. But the, the scenes, many of the scenes are about the stories of the people. Um, so this is then tur I turn to the, uh, to the notion of characters. Uh, so I'm using the language of characters, borrowing it uh, actually from literary theory, because um, I think uh, uh, literary theory has some insights about characters which are useful for understanding the way I write about my characters. Um, I tell stories of many characters. Um, they're from different walks of life. Uh, I mentioned healthcare workers and diarists and patients, but also volunteers, writers, uh, you know, retirees, teachers, um, many different 
um, people from different walks of life. I thought when I was, uh, you know, trying to focus on the stories of these characters, uh, one advantage um, is that it puts human agents at the center of history, human stories, human agents at the center of history. Uh, I say this because uh, social scientists, in my view, are often more interested in making theoretical and conceptual arguments and contributions than in creating characters. Um, but, but we do recognize that people play a role in history. So there's no reason why we can't pay more attention to characters, to their role in history. Uh, so I'm, let me give you just one example out of the many characters. And this is a very well-known example for the, uh, for the Chinese public, at least. Um, it's sometimes called Wuhan auntie's swearing speech, or uh, simply Wuhan swearing. It happened on February 22nd, 2020. Um, so on that day, a uh, WeChat audio file um, became viral. You know, the nickname of the file, people instantly nicknamed it the Wuhan swearer. It became viral on social media. It was a recording of anonymous Wuhan woman venting her anger at the party secretary and the manager of a neighborhood supermarket. The woman spoke very strong Wuhanese dialect and used four letter words um, quite blatantly. People on social media all applauded her for her bold swearing. And one diarist, which I think I quoted in the book, wrote that the auntie's swearing had cathartic effects on the city. A, a city, you know, uh, in the middle of uh, February, late February, was still uh, very much uncertain about uh, when the lockdown would be lifted. So it had cathartic effects on the city because, you know, it was like the auntie was speaking their own minds, you know, the lockdown, uh, during this period, people had accumulated, really accumulated strong emotions of uh, resentment. And now finally, this, this very loud swearing became an outlet for pouring out um, public emotions. So, you know, when scholars talk about people making history, we tend to think of individuals making revolutions or leading social movements or organizing for change. But the Wuhan auntie's short swearing speech, I think, was a history-making act, no less, because she stirred up public sympathies and public emotions in powerful ways. I think the history of the Wuhan lockdown would be incomplete without her story. Um, at least from my perspective. So that's, that's just one example. Um, so th my stories of the characters in Wuhan, uh, I, you know, here is where the literary uh, notion of character comes in. I think of them as, there's definitely portraits of real persons and personal experiences, but at least to some extent, they are social types as well, almost like, you know, they're fictionalized to a certain extent, fictionalized in the sense, or dramatized in the sense that uh, uh, they were developed, you know, um, the, the uh, ideas about them, um, details about them were discussed, circulated, uh, uh, sometimes exaggerated online. So dramatized and fictionalized to a certain extent, to dramatic effects, definitely. But they are, in that sense, social types, public types, um, and they represent, I think, um, more than their individual experiences. They're about, you know, if, uh, a story of, of, a, of a healthcare, of a physician like Dr. Uh, Eisen uh, and other doctors with, whose stories I wrote about. There are the stories about health workers in general. I mean, a lot of their stories may resonate with health workers here in Philadelphia or in New York. And uh, the same, I think, is true of stories of COVID patients, of volunteers. And, you know, they are individual, individual stories, but they represent the stories of many others like them in Wuhan and elsewhere. So character in that sense is 
both personal personality, individual personality, and social type. And I, I thought that uh, is a helpful idea for me. Um, I, I see that I need to, um, I'll finish very quickly. Just a few words about the third aspect about context, uh, which I also I'm sensing, you know, I'll borrow the idea from um, literary theory uh, as well as uh, history and sociology. Literary scholars have debated for a long time about how context matters to the understanding of texts. Some think they don't matter that much. Others uh, argue it's impossible to understand texts without context. Historians, social scientists uh, are engaged in this debate too. Um, William Sewell Jr., we all know, for example, in his Logics of History, emphasizes the importance of histor what he calls historical contextualization. Quote, we cannot know what an act or utterance means or what its consequences might be without knowing the semantics, the technologies, the conventions, in brief, the logics that characterize the world in which the action takes place. So the challenge is how, how I can try to characterize that broader world behind these characters and scenes. Um, it's not an easy uh, job, um, um, I, but I believe it was necessary and important context. Uh, I think it's especially important um, for understanding different cultures and societies like China. Um, I, I think China is particularly relevant, uh, be, you know, important for contextualization because uh, current discourses about China in the media, especially, uh, do not often provide adequate context. So uh, even though the book focuses on storytelling, I try to provide as much context as possible um, and how to select what context to include, what not to, that's challenging. And my consideration was to try to provide more context for issues or matters which might be particularly controversial or complicated or which have deeper cultural resonances. So for example, the entire chapter two focuses on the retreat of civil society and the transformation of Chinese internet culture in the decade prior to the lockdown as a condition for understanding uh, you know, the lockdown. Um, chapter on lockdown diaries has discussions about early diary writing to help contextualize the meaning of diary writing in China. Um, um, so uh, I think I, uh, my time is, I, I, I've used up quite a bit of time. I, I would like to save time for, for comments and questions. Um, so Eric, should I stop here? That, that, that's terrific. We, we could listen to you all night, but it's it's a great idea to bring in Lily and Ian and, we, and we'll have, give you some it's plenty of time in a few minutes to uh, to come back and say more. I just want to test very quickly to how useful this context is. Uh, I, I, I just taught this book to my graduate seminar this afternoon, uh, and it was really remarkable to see a very cosmopolitan and international group of young people uh, express their sense that they, they truly did not understand both the, the things that had happened uh, in the first few months of the pandemic in China uh, at the level of basic reporting, but also the meaning of a lot of, of the debates that they were that they had read about. Um, and, and the book was really useful for, 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 you know, for making sense of, you know, why are there fan groups uh, weighing in on debates about life on, in, the, in the lockdown and what the government is doing and why is there this interest in positive energy on the internet? Why, I mean, why is everyone talking about the positive energy and why are people being censored for not bringing positive energy to a conversation about, about a, a health crisis? Uh, so you, 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 know, you really sparked a lot of conversation in the classroom and I, I know this book is gonna continue to do that. Um, let me stop and bring in uh, Lily Chumley. Thank you. So first of all, thank you, Professor Young, for this incredible book, in addition to um, all the in enormously influential work you've made over the years. But I want to say, first of all, building on what Eric said, that the um, frame that you build around the event of the lockdown um, is constantly punctured by uh, 
uh, threads leading back uh, into 21st century history, right, and uh, into 20th century history and deeper. So both a political history, a social history, a media history, um, and a semiotic history, like a, a, a sense of textual references is constantly being brought in. And that is just such an enormous um, work to do in the midst of this chaos that I, you know, I just want to um, let everyone know that when you jump into this book, you will not be just reading the stories of uh, a short few months, but the stories of decades um, woven together around what happened in this event. And the core um, uh, moment for me uh, was the noticing of the conjuncture between uh, New Year's, where we are again tonight, um, and the kind of media tendencies and discourse practices around New Year's. And then the uh, the uh, political um, order, right, around the two sessions as a, a kind of um, uh, enforcement of positive speech. So uh, Professor Young describes how uh, one of the key reasons for the uh, initial lack of disclosure seems to have been this tendency in general for media not to have bad news, you know, during uh, important political meetings. And for anybody who knows that history, that'll be obvious. And for anybody who doesn't know that history, it'll be really, really important for understanding what happened because in the US in the months after so much speculation anchored around what public health authorities in Wuhan were doing. And so seeing that kind of history of a set of um, structures of media relations to politics and uh, uh, along with um, political ca calendars conjoining with, um, you know, um, the calendar of the year itself, like the deepest cosmology in time uh, is really key. And so starting from that point, right at the very beginning of the book and thinking about Wuhan as a, a, itself a point of conjuncture between transit pathways, shipping pathways, rivers, um, and, and that's an essential uh, location that gets locked down. Um, this book uh, gives a story of COVID, I think, in, in general, that, that uh, is so important for everyone to read. Um, that historical frame in terms of um, transitions in, in um, policy around media is uh, the first thread that runs through the book that I think any uh, scholar of political media operations and of content moderation in, in media studies needs to read, to think with. Um, the second uh, is the attention to the history of um, discursive trends, uh, ideological moves, rhetorical gestures that uh, get repeated, that get drawn on, and in that come to organize a lot of the public health discourse and the narratives surrounding um, how the lockdown proceeds. And the third is just this question of reading every text in context, context itself as an open and variable thing, not a one context, but a multiplicity of um, frames that have to be brought to bear to understand each little blog post. And so um, as a work of history for the present, I think it's invaluable. Um, second, as a media scholar, there's a theme that runs throughout here, not just of reading, um, the blog posts and reading the stories and reading the voices of characters, as, as you mentioned, um, thinking through um, this text as exhibiting what Bakhtin called genuine heteroglossia, right? The real multiplicity of voices really transcribed to the page, the highest um, uh, form of phrase that he could have for a work like this, this is that. Um, but it's more than that because so many of the moments that um, Professor Young writes in this book uh, are moments in which we're looking at something other than text or something other than speech, right, alone. So not just message, but uh, forms of phatic communication. So noise, shouting, um, uh, the ringing of the gong that's really a pot and pan, right, um, and, uh, and images all conveyed through the text of blogs. So thinking about how to recognize the importance of, um, let's say, uh, 
non-representational <laughs> modes of communication, right? As interactional text, the phatic form, the, the banging noise, and the way that it can get mobilized by an individual on a balcony or by a city to really radically different ends, um, it, you know, is, is fundamental. And so as a, for media scholars, this text is also really generative for how to think through um, social media posts and think them in their multiplicity of contexts and how to think about um, uh, faded communication, about uh, forms of contact, of shouting, even of, uh, as you mentioned previously, um, the curse as, you know, um, the vulgarity as uh, a kind of claim. And what's core here is an understanding of so much of the dialogue as a multiply layered kind of um, political hailing and address, um, and address by the state and address by local public health authorities and address by people enacting the, um, the mass or the people in themselves or um, enacting the, the, the citizen, right? Um, so much of what's core here is the question of political healing. And then uh, within the, the history of um, positive energy discourse, uh, we also see woven an understanding of uh, worries around performance and performativity, right? The insincere performance or the radical performance that attempts a kind of claim on a hailing of um, uh, public health authorities. Um, such as the banging of the gong or the shouting in the street, right? Uh, yeah. So there's so much to draw on to think of methodologically or to think of as a history of China. But now I just want to think about it as um, in terms of COVID because we're still here. And, you know, um, reading about this lockdown uh, on this week, thinking about um, where we were two years ago, right? Um, there's, I have, I, I'm so angry. <laughs> I'm just so angry as I read this at the failures to record both the failures and the, and the you know, um, achievements to make public health be concerned primarily with saving people. I mean, in the US, right? Um, to focus our attention on fundamentally uh, maintaining people's safety. This failure is at every level and so much of it can be explained through the kind of, you know, um, let's say a, a larger scale um, and longer duration insistence on the kinds of control of information uh, that, you know, provoked so much anger in the early stages of the Wuhan lockdown. So I can't help but think of the continued insistence that we didn't need masks, right, by the CDC, or that we can switch from a 10-day quarantine to a five-day quarantine as examples of the same mistakes that this book details so much anger over being repeated again and again, right? So my final question, because right? um, I have 10 minutes, and this is on my last minute, um, is to think about how the theme of COVID nationalism that is woven through this book can provoke questions for all of us in how to uh, address our own public health authorities. What drums do we need to bang, right, uh, at this moment to get um, a policy that's focused on, on people and not on recuperating history in the service of uh, concealing and covering over uh, all the the death that has happened. And this book ends with a chapter of memorials, uh, something that we've lacked so much in the city where so many more people died. So uh, as, as inappropriate as it is to talk about memorial on this night of all nights, I, I hope that this book can, can produce that anger that I felt reading it in all of you so that, you know, we can think about where we need to go next. Thank you. Lily, thank you so, so much for that. And I really appreciate you making the connection between, you know, what we read about 
uh, in Guoban's book about Wuhan and how we think about our own experience and situation here. Uh, one of the really striking things for my class today was the extent to which uh, within China, the public health effort actually involved a tremendous amount of cooperation uh, and solidarity and recognition of the notion that, you know, the, our, our fate as people is linked to the fate of the people around us. And it was really fascinating for the students to see how many people in China were upset with policy officials uh, for, you know, for, for failing to implement uh, policies that, that they agreed with rather than for challenge, rather than challenging the fundamentals of the, of the policies themselves, rather than challenging the idea that, you know, it's by taking care of the collective that you create a space for individual freedom. Uh, it, it becomes very clear that the problem is that uh, not everyone was able to um, uh, promote the collectivism uh, that, that, that people generally wanted. And so the dynamic there was very different. And, you know, one virtue of this book is that it, it helps us see ourselves uh, in, in contrast. Um, it, the, the book, in addition to these individual stories, also is kind of fundamentally about a politics um, on, at many levels. Uh, politics inside of China about about information and politics uh, beyond China about the way that China engages the world and so you know it's for for that reason that I'm very excited we also have Ian Johnson with us tonight and so uh, Ian I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I wanted to say I mean first of all I I really appreciated this book on on a couple of levels. Um, one I was in China during the beginning of the outbreak and. Uh, recall vividly these emotions that you captured uh, by looking at the diaries. I wasn't in Wuhan, I was in Beijing, but the city went into a mini lockdown and the streets were empty, the parks were empty, people sort of bought food carefully, the, the um, housing compounds were beginning to have these temperature checks and, and everything like that. Um, and I remember also the thrill of reading the works of the citizen journalists and diarists at the time. And wondering how widely spread they were, how many they were, and what their significance was. And so that's what's so great about reading this book. Um, so also so close to the event, maybe that you can, I didn't really realize how many diaries there were, I think. And the significance that you give them um, really adds. I mean, also, I, I find the book really interesting, because I'm, I'm finishing a book now myself on uh, counter histories in China, citizen efforts to document their country's history in all of its aspects. And so these efforts in Wuhan, of course, are, are part of that, that, that you document that by sort of ordinary people. I mean, some ordinary, some well-known novelists and, and, and other people like that, intellectuals, but, um, but a whole range of people to set down these events. And I, I, it made me recall sort of nostalgically the time in the uh, maybe a decade earlier um, when there were so many more of these things going on in China, so many more underground documentary films, um, underground journals, and, you know, using the word underground, however you want to call it. In Chinese, I, I tend to use the word minjian, like civil or, or, or popular or something like that. Um, and so when I was so I found this, you know, it was at this effort and this time at Wuhan was quite remarkable. Um, so, yeah, the sheer amount of material. Um, and I think it also, if I think of this, you know, from a, now my current job at the Council on Foreign Relations, um, I, I, it makes me also think that this challenges how we understand China. There's a sort of consensus in Washington and in many um, international capitals. Um, that China is, to use the title of a, a work that came out a couple of years ago, a perfect dictatorship, that it's got it all figured out, it can control people um, almost perfectly, it has all the big data and, and all of these things that it, it needs. And yet we have examples like this that show that the, that the state isn't always all powerful. And there are these eruptions, these moments that the state just can't hold you know, where the matrix doesn't work or something like that. So I thought that that was really fascinating. I, I wondered if maybe you could also talk about that a little bit. And then another thing that, that 
that came to me in the course of my own research and in reading these things, uh, and you talk about this at the end of the of, of your book when you talk about um, so that so many of these uh, pictures and 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 diaries and and think accounts were erased and are, are not found anymore. And you write, um, but those that disappear may leave traces. Some are stored in the personal archives of savvy readers. Other live, others live in the online chats among friends. Some live on in this book. Um, and I, I wondered that, I, I thought that was a great way of putting it also. And I wondered your view on how, how this settles in China. How does it, does it, and I don't even know if the term is, if you accept the term or find it valid or not, but does it somehow settle into the collective memory, even though these things are erased and, and it's hard, they're hard to find? Do they have an impact at all? Or are they the exception that proves the rule that the state has this overwhelming power? And yeah, for like a month or two, it couldn't quite keep control over everything. But then after a while, the, the state brings the hammer down and um, and these things are kind of erased. And so I wondered how to think of these, um, the significance of these, I guess, for, for Chinese society and, 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 and memory of historical memory in China for how people remember the events or has the state's narrative that, uh, you know, there was a harsh, maybe a few mistakes were made, but basically it was way better than what anybody else was doing. If that sort of narrative is 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 going to last forever. I mean, certainly right now, if you did an opinion poll in China, that would probably be the overwhelming consensus. People would say, yeah, that's that's correct. But um, whether these things matter, I guess, in the long run. So I guess those would be my, those are my initial thoughts. Um, and those would be my questions. I'll just keep it short so we can have time for your response and other people's questions. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, uh, Ian. I uh, appreciate the succinctness. Uh, uh, I know there's a lot behind each of those questions, um, but it gives us all a little bit of space to um, uh, to think and to ask uh, some some additional questions as well. So so let me remind everyone that, um, and we're going to give Guobin a little time to to respond as he sees fit. And then please, uh, if you have a question, uh, just type it into the Q and A function at the at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, Guobin, why don't you um, pick up? any of the um, uh, issues that, uh, you, that you want us to dive deeper into. Sure, Eric. Um, just want to thank uh, Lily and Ian for uh, such uh, really wonderful, thoughtful uh, comments highlighting some of the key features of the book. Um, I'll just uh, respond to one point from each. Lily's point about uh, the performance and performativity of some of these actors actions uh, are precisely on target. Um, I try not to use that language uh, there. Um, so throughout the book, I try to avoid um, as much as possible uh, abstract language. But one thing I try to do in a, a variety of places is to try to, you know, by letting the characters speak um, or act, it's actually a kind of performance. It performs the, the it performs the act. Um, so in that sense, it's a kind of performativity. It's a way of reenacting that little drama two years ago. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, uh, Ian's uh, you know uh, point about historical memory is really important, and it's one thing that um, uh, again I was fascinated by when I was reading, collecting these stories, dealing with uh, erasures on a daily basis. Um, and the way you describe this, you know, your, your uh, study of the history of this kind of uh, unofficial memory or underground memory, there are sudden eruptions, you know, you don't know coming out where. That's something that I feel happens as well in the case in this Wuhan lockdown. So I guess a couple of things. Um, historical memories can sometimes seem to disappear, like you know the posting, some of many of the diaries are gone. Um, but uh, like I try to say in the book, they settle somewhere um, in some spaces uh, and keep remain silent. And you don't know when they're gonna erupt uh, and they can, they can erupt in very powerful ways or individual 
forms. One example I gave in the book was uh, 2021, one year ago, New Year, I mean, the Lunar New Year. One of the diarists, one of the, uh, who was a poet and whose diary postings kept being censored. He was most articulate about his experience of censorship. So he, he, he wrote about this uh, in his diary. He said, you know, this was, uh, a week before the Lunar New Year, which in Chinese was the Xiao Nian, little, little New Year or minor New Year. He was taking a taxi uh, and the taxi driver was driving him uh, through the, uh, under uh, the tunnel. In the middle of the, in the drive, the taxi suddenly said, just like out of nowhere, today was the anniversary of the death of Dr. Liu Wen Liang. He was, you know, the, the diarist, the, the poet Xiao Yin was moved, was touched, you know. It's like you know, a stranger, right, in the middle of driving a client, suddenly burst out with this kind of, it's, I think uh, Yin's uh, language of eruptions captures that kind of, uh, of behavior. You, you never know when this kind of memory will erupt uh, out of somewhere. Um, so I, I, I love the way you, you, you describe this. And, you know, a lot of the diarists are very conscious of history. I mean, they, they, a number of them, again, cited, they kept explaining to themselves, why am I writing this diary? Why am I writing this diary? This is history, so important. I've got to keep a record of it, even if it's a record myself, but maybe it has a bigger significance. So there is that awareness and sense. I, I don't know where that comes from. I'd love to, to hear more from you, you know, that, that they wanted to record the history, document the history at a personal level, despite all the hardships in you know, managing the lockdown. It's just an amazing experience. So thank you both. Could, could, could I ask uh, Lily or Ian, if you would like to engage a little bit further, you know, feel free uh, to, you know, while we're um, uh, kind of starting the conversation, Guoban, I, I wonder if you could characterize for us the, the state of the conversation today in China uh, has the experience been largely black boxed uh, and set aside as a story internally uh, that's a, kind of officially a success? Uh, is there a legacy of concern about, you know, the initial months of the pandemic where, you know, it seemed that it was very difficult to get the message out and the warning kind of was not spreading internally or from China to other countries? Uh, you know, if I if I were to go to China now and, and try to get a beat on the a read on the situation, you know, what what would I see? What would I find today? I think it's um, it's uh, again years um, a description of the condition of historical memory uh, again is uh, relevant here. Um, so I tried to talk a little bit about this in the last chapter on memory and uh, mourning. Uh, you know, even in the middle of the lockdown, uh, already authorities were trying to um, build, uh, uh, cultivate a master narrative of history. Um, and uh, soon after the lockdown, there were national exhibitions of the heroes of the lockdown. Um, the war on, on COVID, um, books were published, but they were so more or less fit into the, that master narrative uh, mode of, uh, of memory. And I think that's still the case today, that uh, these individual voices that uh, I really wanted to highlight in the book, uh, uh, many of them uh, are no longer online, at least no longer available. Uh, some of them um, are, are still writing, some of them still writing, still writing pandemic diaries because, you know, or, or commentaries, but, uh, but uh, a lot have disappeared. So, so I think um, it's like uh, uh, two years ago, that's a long time ago, that's history. And now we just want to move forward. And uh, we no longer see that kind of uh, you know, in Lily's language, multiplicity of voices. I feel that the voices, the range of voices has narrowed down. It's now dominated by official narrative of the lockdown. Mm -hmm. Lily and Ian, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about this as well. I mean, one of the very powerful things about 
this book is that uh, you know, unlike a lot of the writing about the pandemic, it's not a, it's not just about kind of making sense of you know what happens in the next pandemic and what are the lessons learned for health policy. In a way, what's interesting about it is it uses the the pandemic itself as a kind of diagnostic tool to understand China. Uh, and and I wonder if if either of you have thoughts about something that this pandemic revealed about media politics uh you know civil civic life in china uh you know that was just a little bit more difficult to see uh without this event i guess um i so one thing that i, I think was really helpful for me in this book was thinking about the complementary roles of um left nationalism and uh if not right nationalism then let's say um uh, a kind of more mainstream nationalism in in forming COVID nationalism here. So the the thought about um, on the one hand, if the term left at some points appears as a term to be specifically eliminated through automated content moderation, on the other hand, you have a whole lot of uh, uh, pseudo Maoists who are you know pushing a very a uh, nationalist interpretation of what happened and how to think about it and participating in, in kind of suppressing critique um, at, toward the end of the book. And at the same time, uh, you have a kind of um, uh, push toward the wolf warrior nationalism of like pushing back against uh, the, you know, honestly, frequently uh, uninformed, um, oversimplifying, if not just downright racist and xenophobic uh, framings of China that that you know form mainstream discourse in the U.S. Um, and and that conflict, I think, is really really helpful for us here to understand because I think well we know two years on that nationalist responses to COVID are um, inevitable failures that. Uh, nationalism is a, a, a mode of response that imagines only the capacity to lock down a, a border completely, which is one of the reasons, you know, um, so many people haven't been able to see their families since the lockdown ended uh, in China at all. And yet, you know, Omicron continues to be a concern there, if not at, at, as much as here. So I guess thinking about how this book sets us up to understand both the framing of a discourse of, of inevitable military conflict between the US and China on the one hand, and on the other hand, to think about a COVID nationalism and forms of, of natalist policy and nationalist policy that have been amplified by COVID here in the US and around the world, I think it's really important. Ian, if you'd like to add anything. Um, yeah, no, I, I just thought I mean, there, there are two things that, in terms of how we view China. Um, one is that the people often underestimate, in, especially in this sort of mainstream discourse and inside the beltway in Washington, which I've been forced to engage with at, at my new job at the council, you get um, this idea that that China is this sort of Brezhnev era Soviet Union. But when you when you look at actually how they responded to the to, to the outbreak, they had so much more uh, bureaucratic competence uh, than in many Western countries. And so even though many of the things were heavy handed, there was a lot of, as, as Guobian points out in the book, there's a lot of buy-in by people to, to quite sens sensible things. And then the other thing I think is that people often, I think in, in the US, and there's, there's a tendency to write off China that we don't need to engage with China. Um, this is sort of becoming, you know, if you, if you even, advocate for engagement, you're seen as some sort of panda hugger. Um, and you can see the previous administration did this series of Harry Carey acts like killing the Ful Fulbright, the Peace Corps, a whole range of things like that. And I think that this book highlights the fact that there are so many interesting people in China with whom we should engage. It doesn't always have to be government officials, but they can be um, pe people on the grassroots level and that we need much more engagement, so many more people inside China studying it, um, reporting on it, et cetera, et cetera, 
rather than less. And I think this, this book just gives an example of so many of the brave, interesting people who are there. And this is obviously a commonplace if you know China, if you engage with China, but it seems like for so many people outside of China, um, they think that the country is some totalitarian, complete, perfect totalitarian dictatorship, and it's not worth engaging with. And I think this helps show the opposite. I mean, it's hard to believe that any place on earth could top our model democracy here in the United States where things are working so well uh, and we're managing all of our problems with uh, such efficiency and success. Uh, but I, I take your point. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I, I see a lot of my colleagues from uh, NYU Shanghai here today, and it's exciting to, to establish these connections. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's uh, seven o'clock, a little beyond, and we promised that these events run for an hour. So, um, Guobin, I want to give you the last word. Uh, and, and before you take it, I want to remind everyone um, that uh, this is the launch of the Wuhan lockdown, which you can now order, and which really is just a fascinating read on so many levels. It's uh, just kind of eye opening to go back to. Uh, those those first few months of what we experienced, and to uh, to get a sense of the the, the kind of radicalism uh, of that time, to see how much transformed so quickly, um, and to be reminded, you know, I think as all of our speakers have told us tonight, that what happened in those moments was not just about those moments; it was, you know, structured and shaped by a, a culture and a history and a politics that um, we all need to understand better. So Guobin, do you want to um, take us out? Only, only thank you and thank you and thank you. I'm so grateful to all of you for really spending time. It's such precious time at this moment, you know, so busy and uh, such a life and still uh, taking the time to read, read the stuff. And, uh, you know, um, I'm so grateful for these uh, comments. Um, so thank you very much again. Okay. Thank you all for joining us this evening. It's been a pleasure. Uh, there's a lot more coming from the IPK in the next few weeks. So please uh, sign up for our mail list if you're not on it. And um, uh, uh, hope to see you back here on Zoom before too long. And even more, I hope to see you all in person uh, down in Greenwich Village. So good night, everyone. And, and thank you, Gobin, for, this, uh, for writing this wonderful book. Thank you. Bye-bye.